Well, like multiple sclerosis itself, research into multiple sclerosis is not very understandable to the general public and often not even talked about, but it's out there. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for, oh my goodness, going on 39 years. And I'm always looking up information about multiple sclerosis so I can sort of stay abreast of the developments even though I don't foresee that any miracle cure is going to be happening anytime soon. Recently, I found a review article about all of the papers that were published on the subject of multiple sclerosis in 2022. And they cover the highlights. I'll warn you right now that it's a highly technical article written for scientists. What I ended up deciding to do was not go through all of it in detail, but to give you kind of a 30,000 foot view looking at the introduction and maybe the intro paragraphs and the summary and just do a little bit of explaining here and there. But I, of course, will cite the whole paper. And if you're interested, you can certainly go look into it because it does show us the breadth and depth of the research that's been going on in multiple sclerosis. Even as we sit here wondering, when are they going to come up with a cure? When are they going to figure out what causes MS? When, when, when? From our perspective, it doesn't feel like much is happening. But there is quite a bit going on. So here's the article, Multiple Sclerosis 2023 Update. It was published in Free Neuropathology in March of 2023. And they actually submitted the article in February of 2023. And I'm pretty impressed if it purports to look at all the articles from 2022. That's a pretty short time between the end of the year and when they got the article together. So I'm kind of thinking they probably were working on it all along. Otherwise, they never could have read all those articles. Because you can see when you get to the very end, there's two pages of articles of published papers that they reviewed. The authors are from the Institute of Neuropathology, the University Hospital in Munster, Germany. And as I said, I'm just going to be reading parts of this. But we'll go ahead and start with the introduction because I think it's pretty good. It's written in fairly understandable terms for those of us who aren't scientists. But it will give you an idea of the breadth of the papers that they looked at. It says that multiple sclerosis is the most frequent inflammatory demyelinating disease of the central nervous system and a leading cause for permanent neurological disability in young adults. The variability in disease course amongst cases is well known. Significant progress has been made during recent years in using systemic immune system directed therapies to prevent relapses that characterize the initial disease course. However, the limited effectiveness of such therapies for the later recognized progressive disease course indicates there is a continuous disease progression independent of relapse activity which may start very early during this condition this is something this is something that dr Giovanoni talks about quite a bit the pria progression independent of relapse activity and also smoldering MS, which is going on at the cellular level and doesn't really show up on the average MRI. So it looks here like there's going to be some attention paid to that particular thing, which is refreshing for those of us who have progressive MS. We are no longer the forgotten stepchildren. We seem to have found <laughs> a place in the research agenda, which I am very happy about. And here's their methodology. They, they say, we select articles published in 2022 that provide insight into susceptibility to multiple sclerosis, number one, the basis of disease progression, number two, and features of relatively recently recognized distinct forms of inflammatory demyelinating disorders of the central nervous system. 
MS has a strong hereditary component, but also environmental factors play an important role, as shown in studies of monozygotic twins discordant for the disease. In other words, twins, one of whom has MS and one of whom does not. Several articles published in 2022 support that Epstein-Barr virus, which has long been implicated in MS, plays an important role in the development of MS. This raises the tantalizing possibility that vaccination against EBV may eliminate MS. Another topic which continues to be heavily discussed in the MS field is the impact of the microbiome, in other words, your digestive tract and all the bacteria that live there, not only in the gut but also in the lung, on MS disease course. Potential mechanisms driving disease progression include persistent focal inflammation resulting in slowly expanding lesions, meningeal inflammation causing cortical demyelination and neuronal injury, and inflammation-induced diffuse changes in white matter as well as loss of compensatory mechanisms such as remyelination and brain plasticity. Those are terms we've talked about here on the channel some, and, and you can see that those are highly important to us and researchers are focusing on it. I'm very glad to see that. We summarized several patho pathological and imaging studies which aim to dissect the underlying mechanisms driving disease progression. However, and with MS there's always a however, these mechanisms most likely vary over time, adding another layer of complexity for the successful development of new treatment strategies to prevent or stop disease progression. Furthermore, individual patient-specific factors may modulate MS patho pathology significantly. This is supported by results from a single nuclei RNA sequencing, SNRNA-SEQ, study of human MS tissue samples, which reveals that the variability in gene expression between patients is higher than between lesions. That's interesting. Based on findings from animal studies, it is assumed that promotion of remyelination can prevent disease progression. However, the evidence that remyelination in MS is neuroprotective is relatively sparse. In 2022, an imaging study provides first evidence that lack of remyelination in MS is associated with increased brain atrophy, a maker of neurodegeneration. I suspect what they mean there is a marker of de neurodegeneration. I noticed going through this, there were a couple of typos, and I don't know if it's because this was translated from the German and somebody made boo-boos there or what, but um, I may point a couple of them out along the way. Being a former editor, typos tend to just sort of leap off the page at me, so sorry about that. But I do think that makes more sense that it would be a marker of neurodegeneration. And then finally, we discuss the most recent findings in myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody associated disease, MOGAD, a relatively recently newly de defined inflammatory and demyelinating disease recognized by the presence of anti myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein or MOG antibodies in the serum, the blood serum, I assume. And then going on, this is the first section, MS Susceptibility and Disease Course Population-Based Studies. And again, I'm not going to read through this whole paper. It's 11 pages long and lots of technical stuff. So I think you've already gotten an idea of what they're going to cover. It'll give us a flavor of what's going on. The first subsection of this first section is the role of Epstein-Barr virus in susceptibility to multiple sclerosis. Epidemiologic-based studies of 2022 bolstered the evidence for EBV infection being a necessary, albeit not sufficient, trigger for, developing, for development of MS. And then there are some different studies that present various kinds of evidence for this. 
and it, they go into some detail about them. And I'm not going to go over those here. I've done some videos on Epstein-Barr virus and multiple sclerosis. I will link those down below. But this final paragraph, we'll go ahead and look at that. These combined population and laboratory-based studies raise the issue of potential benefits of EBV-directed vaccines in the very young population. Because you do have to catch it young. People get Epstein-Barr virus very young. And so if you're going to have a vaccine to prevent it, you do need to get that pretty early in life. However, one need consider the potential risk of such vaccination, including introducing a neural target directed cross reactive immune response and persistent modulation of overall immune regulatory mechanisms, which may have protective purposes. Then the next section is microbiome impacts on disease susceptibility and course in MS. They say, having identified that an array of environmental factors contribute to the susceptibility and course of MS, the challenge remains to understand the underlying mechanisms for such effects. Further research is needed to find out how these factors can act via modulating the systemic immune system to acquire pro-inflammatory properties. And that is going to be a common thing as well. Further research is necessary, and I think always will be when it comes to MS. And just looking here at the paragraph on the bottom, the microbiome serves as a major interaction of a host with the environment. The gut is long recognized as a major resonant niche for the immune system, being a major site of host interaction with the enormous population of resident microbes all of which play a role in keeping us healthy and alive, but at the same time can be a source of problems for those of us who end up having MS. Again, I'm not going to go through all these long studies that they describe in some detail, but I do recommend that you take a look at the parts that you're particularly interested in. But they say in conclusion that the above studies indicate the potential for the microbiome in multiple niches to impact on MS throughout its disease course. So not just in causing the initial disease or getting it started, but continuing it on. The microbiome influences on adaptive immune cells would impact on their initial activation and migration into the central nervous system as part of new lesion formation. Modulation of the endogenous glial cell populations, astrocytes, microglia byproducts derived from the microbiome would impact on the extent to which these glial cells participate in tissue injury and repair processes throughout the MS disease course. Then the next subsection is progressing, progression independent of relapse activity. Progression independent of relapse activity or PIRA or PIRA, you have I know heard about this, Dr. Giovanoni talks about it quite a bit, but I've heard others mention this term as well. And this is, this is kind of what he's getting at with his idea of smoldering MS, that even though your MRI does not show that you're having anything new going on in your brain, no, no new lesions, no new white spots, and maybe you don't even have any symptoms per se that are new, still the, the disease itself and kind of the background is lurking away and working away at you. It's kind of like termites munching on the underside of your house. You might not realize it's going on, but it's going on. The natural history of multiple sclerosis has been considered in terms of relapsing and progressive categories. The latter could occur in those with previous clinical relapses, secondary progressive or not. Specific criteria have been defined for diagnosis of either relapsing or primary progressive forms of the disease that now include paraclinical measures, cerebrospinal fluid and imaging, as well as clinical features. Progressive progression need not be sustained in either secondary progressive or primary progressive forms, resulting in use of the term confirmed progression over three to six months in clinical trials. More recent focuses 
whether progressive forms are associated with ongoing disease activity as defined by imaging or clinical activity, introducing the term progression independent of relapse activity or PIRA. This designation has inquired, acquired increased significance in that regulatory approval for agents in secondary progressive MS has been denied for cases lacking of documented activity. Hmm, interesting. And we'll go ahead again and we'll scroll down a little more to the next section, which is focal inflammation as a driver of disease progression. The observation that disease progression is driven by mechanisms other than peripherally driven acute focal inflammatory lesions raise the issue of the pathogenic mechanisms responsible for progression. This has become a hot topic for both histopathologic and serial neuroimaging studies, with the challenge of how to reconcile these two approaches. Both have implicated pathogenic processes in the white matter, cortical gray, paraventricular, and spinal cord regions of the central nervous system. Well, let's go ahead and scroll down a little further here. They're looking at various parts of the brain then. It was con considered originally that MS only affected parts of the brain, but now they're finding lesions all over the place, depending on the course of your disease. The next section, section two, is MS susceptibility and disease course tissue-based studies. So this is the section that talks about who gets MS and maybe why. The first subsection is meningeal inflammation correlates with lesion activity. The meninges are the three layers of membrane that cover and protect your brain and your spinal cord. And it says here that they consist of the dura mater, and I want to say it's matter, but then again, I could be wrong. The leptem, leptomeninges comprising the pia matter and arachnoids. During recent years, a number of papers have elucidated the relationship between leptomeningeal inflammation and subpeal cortical lesions. Subpeal lesions are more frequently found in close proximity to meningeal infiltrates, and subpeal demyelination is associated with neuronal oligodendroglial and astrocytic injury and loss. Cortical pathology is now considered as a driver of disease progression. I know that a lot of those terms are quite technical, but they're finding some relationships and some causalities that they had not found before. And they're, they're not definitive, of course, at this point, but they're certainly suggestive. And as they say in the last paragraph of that section, in line with this observation are studies which demonstrated a correlation between numbers of leptomeningeal B cells and paravascular T and B cells in white matter or brainstem lesions. And if you're not totally following this, I understand because I'm not either, but I think what we're seeing is just the level of the research that's being done is not probably something that we talk about with our doctors at all because it's not something that would really come up in most of the conversations that we have. We see the symptoms. We see what effects it's having on us. But this is the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Then there's another subsection, cellular trafficking to and from the meninges. Interesting one. I'd never even thought about that. It says here the bidirectional communication between the systemic and central nervous system compartments is a central process contributing to the disease course of multiple sclerosis. To be considered are the connections whereby systemic immune constituents can access the central nervous system and how materials released within the CNS are cleared from this compartment and transferred back to the systemic compartment. Very interesting. I had no idea. And it goes on to talk more about that. It was just very interesting how far in depth we have to go to really understand the mechanisms of MS. The next section is diffuse white matter inflammation and it's, now see here are your typos, diffuse white matter inflammation and its consequences for the myelin axon unit. 
The pathogenic mechanisms driving disease progression independent of new lesions are, so far, only incompletely understood. Potential mechanisms include the expansion of focal lesions, as described above, but also diffuse check changes in normal appearing white matter in multiple sclerosis. And then they go on and they discuss some of the studies that looked at that. It says that further studies are required to determine whether the same changes occur throughout the CNS in patients with MS when these changes start and whether these pathological changes correlate with progression independent of relapse activity. All good information to have, and I'm glad they're looking at it. I think especially for those with secondary progressive, we kind of feel like we're in no man's land. I know that I go through long plateaus where I don't really get any new symptoms and my existing symptoms don't get any worse or at least significantly worse. But I know that I still have MS and I know that it's working at some level. I'd like to know more about that and I'd like to, somebody to be able to figure out how to stop it. And I'm hoping that that's kind of what these scientists are looking at. The third section is MS Susceptibility and Disease Course, New Technologies. And so this is the one that's going to look at who gets MS and perhaps why. The first subsection is in vivo imaging to assess consequences of demyelination and presence of remyelination in MS. And this, again, would be the gold standard if we could get that going on. In vivo means in a living organism as opposed to in vitro, which is in some kind of a petri dish or a test tube or some kind of lab equipment. So in vivo actually to me is a step forward if we can get some good data out of that, preferably in humans, although I realize there are ethical problems with trying experiments on humans. So often they rely on mice and let's face it, mice are not people, they are mammals, there is some similarity, but their reaction to things is not likely to be just the same as ours is. The first paragraph here says that emerging concepts suggest that a combination of persisting focal and diffuse inflammation within the CNS and gradual failure of compensatory mechanisms, including remyelination and brain plasticity, result in disease progression. So, the disease progresses partly because the compensatory mechanisms that our body has start to fail. And the two ones that they highlight here are the ability of the body to remyelinate. The nervous system does remyelinate. We get damage to our nervous system all our lives long. Before we have any MS going on, remyelination happens without us even noticing it. The other is brain plasticity. Now, this is something I've done a video about. Brain plasticity is highly important. We can control part of it. We can do that through different specific movements that will reinforce pathways in the brain that we want to reinforce. The other thing about brain plasticity that I thought was quite interesting is that there are some neurological impairments where brain plasticity is not under our control at all. There's nothing we can do exercise-wise or movement-wise to make a difference, but MS is one of the few, if not the only, where we can make some difference. So also on the scientific level, I'm glad that they're looking into this. And we're not going to go through the detail, of course, because there's lots of it, and it gets pretty technical pretty fast. But it's good to know that they're looking at those two things. And of course, at the end, they say further studies comparing different imaging technologies with his histopathological findings are required to evaluate the advantage and limitations of these approaches to the follow-up of remyelination in people with MS. And oh, wouldn't we love to see that. The next subsection is Novel Molecular Technologies to Dissect MS Pathogenesis in Human Tissue Sections. And as they say, a number of studies so far have analyzed human MS tissue samples by SNRNA-SEQ. However, these studies included only a relatively small number of tissue samples from few patients. 
And then they go on to say that there have been some larger studies more recently, but those are not ready for prime time yet. So that they're still going to be looking at this for quite some time. As they say near the end, one caveat might be that the authors used pseudotemporal biostatistical approaches to identify early neurodegenerative events. It would be desirable to validate these results in tissue samples from MS patients with ongoing cortical demyelination, but these lesions are rarely available in post-mortem tissue collections. Using complex and elegant biostatistical analyses, including in vivo central nervous system disease model data and their own spatial transcriptomic and proteomic results, they identified and prioritized CNS-enriched receptors as well as new pharmacological drug targets. And then finally, we have the fourth section, which is other demyelinating diseases. There are other demyelinating diseases besides multiple sclerosis, and we can learn about MS from learning more about those. As they say, multiple sclerosis remains a diagnosis based on carefully considered clinical and MRI-based criteria, plus cerebral spinal fluid findings of immunoglobin synthesis and oligoclonal bands. Although considered an autoimmune disorder, no specific antigen-directed immune response is yet incorporated into the diagnostic criteria. However, over the last years, antigen-specific immune responses have been identified in patients who would previously have been included within the MS umbrella. And it turns out they're not. And I wanted to scroll down here to where it talks about the specific things that they need to exclude because just because these resemble MS in some ways don't doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they are. Consensus clinical syndromes and MRI findings related to optic nerve, spinal cord, area postrema, other brain stem, diencephalic or cerebral presentations are now recognized. More recent has been recognition of monophasic or recurrent syndromes linked to the presence of anti-MOG antibody. These expanding syndromes now include optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, encephalitis, and seizures, as well as aseptic meningitis and peripheral nervous system demyelination. So there you go. There's just because... Those seem to have some superficial resemblance to MS and even have symptoms in common. It doesn't mean they're actually full-blown MS, but we can learn about the mechanisms of demyelination from looking at those particular conditions. And finally, let's go ahead and just read the summary. The development of successful systemic immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory treatment options for MS within the last two decades, resulted in the discovery of progression independent of relapse activity. To dissect the underlying mechanisms driving this progression represents currently the biggest challenge in the field of MS. No animal model for the progressive disease phase of MS exists. Therefore, clinically well-characterized human tissue collections and modern technologies such as SCSN RNA sequencing and spatial transcriptomics will be essential to dissect the cellular and molecular mechanisms driving disease progression and to detect potential biomarkers. Clinical imaging and other paraclinical studies are required to further validate candidate pathways and potential biomarkers. Here we summarize some studies which started to disentangle the underlying pathways for disease progression and may serve as blueprint for future studies. And that is where things stand as of, as of the end of 2022. We know that, of course, we're more than halfway to, through 2023, so I do hope that these folks or others put out a similar article that summarizes the key research for 2023.
there's a lot going on in MS. As you can see, I'm just going to scroll through these references. You can see that they looked at a lot of papers. And I'm sure there were many others that they decided not to consider. But in looking at what's been done, we can't help but feel that at least companies are funding this research and it's been ongoing for quite some time now and will continue into the future. I'm really looking at all of the breakthroughs and of course a little bit skeptical, but also with some hope because even a breakthrough that doesn't lead us to the final goal might get us there or at least eliminate a pathway that we otherwise would have wasted a lot of time and effort going down. And I think that's something that we can all be grateful for. Well, as I said, there's quite a lot there and a lot of it kind of goes over my head. So I'm sure it goes over most people's heads. I am glad, however, that these authors have put this review together because as technical as it is, I think I'd even be more lost in the technical details if I tried to look at each and every article that's listed in the two pages of references that they have at the end. But I don't know, did you find this encouraging? I, I sort of did in the sense that there's a lot going on and they're not giving up. So we don't need to feel that we've been forgotten, even though from day to day, it just doesn't really feel like a lot has happened to change our situation. Sooner or later, there'll be the breakthrough or the multitude of breakthroughs that will be able to do something to make our prognosis a little bit more promising, perhaps. Sooner or later, they're going to get maybe not to the bottom of it, but at least to a level where they can do some stuff that doesn't have dire side effects and is effective and actually can cure MS rather than just pick at the edges of the problems. That's my hope anyway. And maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm just being overly optimistic. And if you think I am, let me know in the comments. In the meantime, however, all I ask is that you take really good care of yourself. And I'll see you again in my next video. Mm -hmm.